and welcome to the single path. In a few videos ago I did an episode on the design and characterization of a single transistor bipolar amplifier. That was a class A amplifier. We went through all the calculations of all the components, figured out what each of the parameters and how it affected the output and we ended up designing, testing and characterizing one of those amplifiers. Now in this episode I want to take that a step further and I want to look at other classes of amplifiers, specifically class B and class AB. I want to contrast and compare them and find out why people did ever needed to go to class B or class AB and what are the differences and advantages of each of those configurations. So we're going to start by briefly looking at the class A, then followed by class B and then class AB, and then more importantly we're going to build those circuits and actually test them and find out how they behave in the lab and what parameters you need to adjust and how to design them and how you choose the component parameters for each of those designs and then we're going to see the imperfections of each of those types of circuits directly in the frequency and in the time domain to really understand the differences between these three types of amplifiers. So I've already prepared a bunch of schematics so let's go over the schematics first as always look at the theory and then we're going to build and test the circuits. So here I'm showing the schematic of three different types of amplifiers. Here's class A, here's class B, and here's class AB. Let's not worry about class B and class AB for a moment. Let's just focus on what we have built before. So we built this circuit before here, uh, which was a class A amplifier, and it had a, uh, essentially a single transistor here and with a load resistor R1 and a degeneration resistor R2, which was shunted with the capacitor C1. And we went through the analysis and, uh, and, and uh, figuring out how this circuit actually works. So, but there is a problem with this. Let's assume that the, the load resistance that I want to drive, the, the load that I want to provide power to, is really small. Let's say, for example, that that load is only 10 ohm. Now, what kind of uh, loads are going to be 10 ohm? Well, for example, here's this, uh, this little speaker that I've taken out of an old laptop. This particular speaker is 8 ohms, which is written right there. On the at the back. So this is an 8 ohm load. If I want to deliver power to this load, I'm going to have to put a lot of current if I want to have any meaningful voltage around it. So let's make some assumptions. Let's assume that I want to deliver 1 volt peak to peak of signal to a load that's about 10 ohms, which means that this 10 ohm resistor here has to be able to see a voltage swing that is about uh, plus and minus 1 volt in total at, at the output. Now, if I want to do that and the load is only 10 ohms, it means that I have to have at least a voltage drop across this resistor at DC that's about 0.5 volts. And if I want to have 0.5 volts across the resistor that is only 10 ohm, I'm going to need 50 milli milliamps of current through it. That is a lot of current to put through a single resistor. Now, the problem with that is that if there is no signal present, this device is always conducting current, which means that this device has a tail current or a bias current, I, that is going to be at least 50 milliamp in this case. If I want to deliver uh, 500 millivolts to a 10 ohm resistor. So the problem with that is that if there is no signal, that 50 milliamp tail current is always there and there is nothing you can do about it. So this device is always conducting current whether there is signal or not. Therefore, if there is no signal, that power is wasted. Now, if I have plus or minus 2.5 volt supply, so I have a total of 5 volt difference, and I have a 50 milliamp of current through it, that's a lot of power that I'm wasting. So, what people have come to do is that they said, well, what if we design a circuit such that we don't need to have a continuous current going through the device all the time, even if there is no signal. Now, that, the fact that there is always a bias current going through the device is what defines the class of this amplifier as being a class A amplifier, which is not very good if you want to deliver a lot of power to a small resistance. And when I say it's not very good, I mean it's not very efficient. The maximum efficiency of a class A amplifier is just over 20%, and there is nothing you can do to really improve that if you have just a passive uh, resistive load. So people want to do something that is better than that. And then you may ask, well, if this is so bad, then why do people use it at all, even if its efficiency is going to be so bad? Why don't we think of something else? Yeah, it's true that the efficiency of the Class A amplifier is bad, but it has some serious advantages. For example, because of the fact that there's always current going through the device, the device is always on and it's operating in its most linear region of operation. You can design this transistor to operate very linearly, given the fact that it always has some current through it. 
And it's not just that, it's also much faster. Turning a transistor completely off and then turning it back on is quite slow. So the transistor that always has a current going through it operates at its fastest region of operation depending on the dimension of the device and the total current that's through it. But without getting into too much detail, two of the main advantages of a Class A amplifier is that it can be made really linear and it can also be made to be really fast. In fact, if you look at any circuit operating above 30 or 40 gigahertz, none of those circuits really really are built using class B amplifiers or class AB amplifiers. Typically they are class A because they are so fast. So we can use it when we need to have a lot of gain as we saw in the previous video where we where we had a much larger load resistance so we were able to get quite a bit of gain and with a, with a little amount of current we were only using 2 milliamps or so. So it can have, it can be very, very good for gain, it can be very low noise, it can be very linear, and it can be very fast, which is all really good, but it's not very efficient in terms of power. So when you want to deliver power to a very small load, like a 10 ohm resistor, you're better off think of something else. And that brings us to class B. Now the, the beauty of class B is that the devices in class B amplifier, here I'm showing the most simple case, aren't always turned on. Let's for example take a quick look at this. Imagine that the input voltage here is 0 volts. So if I put, oop, if I put uh, 0 volts here, let's see what happens to the region of operation of these devices. This load resistor, which is 10 ohm, which is, which is the load that I want to deliver power to, like a speaker. The end of that is connected to ground also. So if you make an assumption and assume that this is also 0 volts to start off and see if that meets the criteria, if this is 0 volts, the output has no current in it, that means the base emitter voltage of transistor Q1 is 0. So this device is turned off. So there's no current in it. And the device at the bottom also has its emitter base voltage equal to 0 volts. So that also is completely turned off, which means that when there is zero volts at the input, there is zero volts at the output, and the total DC current going through the output is zero. So this circuit consumes no power if there is no signal present at its input, which is perfect, because if there is no signal, why should you be burning any power? Now, the reason that it's using two complementary devices, an NPN and a PNP, is that the NPN device only reacts to positive input voltages because you need a positive base emitter voltage in order to turn this device on. And you need a positive emitter base voltage to turn this device on. Which means that this guy can handle the positive swing of the output and the bottom transistor can handle the negative swing at the output. I mean, and when they are operating in this fashion, when they're configured like this, they work as a push-pull configuration and then therefore they can produce a complete sign at the output. So if I were to put a sign, uh, sign input, and I would get a sign output. And the gain is positive because during the positive cycle of the input signal, transistor Q1 operates as an emitter follower or a common collector. And at the negative swing, then the bottom transistor operates as an emitter follower or a common collector amplifier. So the gain, in theory, is approximately equal to 1 uh, if the load is not really, really small. Now, this is all nice and beautiful and has no current consumption, but it has a major problem. I don't know if you can detect it by looking at it, but think about what it takes to turn this device on. Let's focus on the top device, for example. As the input voltage rises and it starts to go up, up until about 0.6 volts or so, the base emitter junction of the transistor Q1 is still turned off and there is no current in it. So there is a region between 0 volts to 0 0.6 volts or so where this device is not on and this device is not on either. So there is a region between 0 to 0.6 where the output does not change even though the input is changing. And that's also true for the negative voltages as well. As the input voltage goes below, below 0, up until about minus 0 0.6 volt, the bottom device is still not turned on. Which means that there is a big region at the input between plus and minus 0 0.6 volts where the output doesn't move at all even though the input is moving. Well that's not very good because that means that not only the output doesn't react to any changes at the input, the devices are completely turned off so the output doesn't even know that the input is changing. So if I were to plot or just kind of estimate what the output would look like is that at the beginning, let me draw it somewhere where you can see it, so at the beginning there is nothing and then the output begins to move and then there's also nothing before the output begins to move. So you're going to get this uh, really ugly uh, waveform where you're missing part of your sinusoid. So this is in this kind of response is in reaction to an input that looks like that. 
why do it in inverse, but you get the idea. So what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to solve this problem. And first we have to understand, well, what is exactly the problem? The exactly the problem, the exact nature of the problem is that between 0 to 0 0.6 volt, this device is off, and between 0 to minus 0 0.6 volt, this device is off. So we have to help these devices turn on faster, which means we have to give them a 0 0.6 volts and a minus 0 0.6 volts in order to keep them just at the edge of being on. We don't want them to be turned off so deep into being off in the off region where we need to spend 0 0.6 to turn them on. We want to give them that 0 0.6 and keep them at the edge of being turned on. That will bring you to a class AB amplifier. So for a class AB amplifier, we, we're inserting the diode D1 and the diode D2 into schematics. So just exactly the same thing, I've just added those diodes. Now let's see what that does. Well, if the input voltage here is, is sorry, if the output voltage is zero volts and I go across the emitter base junction, I, this node can be at 0 0.6 volts. In this case, this transistor is at the edge of being on. And if this is at 0 0.6 volts, we're jumping across another diode, but this time in the reverse direction. So now this voltage ends up being back to being at 0 volts. Now we follow it the other way. If this is at 0 volts and we're going down through this diode, then this voltage is sitting at minus 0 0.6 volts. And then we're going across another base emitter junction, except in the opposite direction, which brings this back, this voltage back to zero. So this condition that you see here, zero here, 0 0.6 here, minus 0 0.6 here, and zero here, is perfect because both of these devices are at the edge of being turned on, or they have very little current, maybe hundreds of microamps through them. And they're at the edge of being turned on, but still the total power consumption is extremely small. Here the total power consumption was zero when there is no input, but here the total power consumption is just above zero, but very, very low compared to this scenario where we would have to have 50 milliamps going through it just so we can satisfy the one volt peak to peak voltage swing that we want to deliver. So now in this case, when the input signal goes up, it's no problem, this device is already at the edge of being turned on, so therefore the output can follow all the way positive and the output can go all the way negative without any region in the middle where we saw this behavior before. This behavior is called a dead zone, meaning that the amplifier is essentially dead. It's not doing anything in this zone of operation, but this amplifier no longer has a dead zone region of operation which is really great because that means that it's going to have a one-to-one -one relationship between the input and the output. And we're going to see what the dead zone does in measurement also. So we're going to build and measure this circuit first so we can see the effect of the dead zone, but we know how to solve it. But this still has one more problem, which I don't like. And the problem is that whenever you want to deliver a lot of power to a, to a, a load resistor, like a 10 ohm resistor, what you want to do is you want to use a power transistor so that the power transistor can handle the total current that is going to flow through it. So let's say that instead of, you know, a one volt, I want to put, a, let's say, three volt peak to peak onto this here. Then I'm going to need a much larger current. So then I'm going to start using power transistor, which is this tip 31 and tip 32 part numbers are power transistors. The problem with power transistors is that they can handle a lot of current, they can handle a lot of voltage, but they have very low beta. So they have very low current gain of the transistor itself, meaning that the base volt, base current, if you remember from the previous video, that the base current, where can I write that, IB is approximately equal to the collector current divided by beta, which means that if the collector current is very large and the beta is very small, the base current can still be significant, meaning that the base will require the source to, to provide it with current or to accept current from the source. This means that the uh, input impedance of the base is actually quite low. So it has a low input impedance and I, I want to fix that because if you want to drive this amplifier from something that has a high output impedance, then the low input impedance of this is going to cause a problem. So what I want to do is I want to, instead of providing the base current to these transistors myself, I want to build another, another circuit to provide that current for me. And the way to do that is to introduce another amplifier instead of just having the diode here, which will just, the current can just freely flow through. So for that, we enter the final schematic, which is a class 
AB amplifier, class a class A followed by a class AB amplifier, which now has a high input impedance. Now this circuit may look complicated, but in reality it is not complicated at all if you if we go through it step by step. And I have added some other components here and I'll explain why. So we have a transistor Q3 and a transistor Q4. Those were the two transistors that did the push and the pull as before. Here's our output load. But let's forget about those two other resistors for now. Now instead of having a diode there, if you remember, here I added the diode D1 and I added the diode D2. Instead of just using actual diodes, we're going to use transistors that have a junction that are themselves diodes. Remember that the base emitter junction of a bipolar transistor is a diode. So I can remove that and use a transistor itself. And this is exactly what I've done here. I've removed that diode and I've used a transistor in its place. Now this transistor is operating as an emitter follower itself. So if we start from here, we go through the base emitter junction and we gain 0.6 volts. And then we go back through the base emitter junction and we lose 0.6 volts. At the bottom, we go through the base emitter junction, we lose 0.6 volts, and we go through the base emitter junction here, we gain 0.6 volts. So in fact, when there is zero volts here, we have about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts here, 0 0.6, minus 0.6, oops, and then we end up with zero volts at the output. So it works exactly like this guy, because it also has 0 0.60, 0, 0 minus 0 0.60, and here we have 0 going through the base emitter, 0 0.6 going through the base emitter, 0, and then 0 going through the base emitter, minus 0 0.6, again base emitter, 0. So in reality, it works very much the same. But of course, this means that I'm going to have to build a common, uh, a common collector amplifier or an emitter follower here, and I'm going to have to build an emitter follower here, which then themselves consume current. But when I do that, the input impedance of these devices in, is improved by another factor of beta. So then we have beta times beta, which is a beta squared, which is much better than before. So if the beta is, let's say, 20, we get a beta of 400 in total, which is much, much better than having a beta of 20. The disadvantage is that we are burning some extra current through these devices, which we will not have done uh, through these uh, bi diodes, because the diodes will probably need a very, very small current for them to work properly. Now, so what else can we do? How do we choose how much current to put through these devices? Well, how much current you put through these common collector devices, this common collector amplifier in the front, is really up to you. But you can do a quick calculation to find out what is sufficient. Let's take an example. For example, we have, we would like to deliver plus and minus uh, 0.5 volts to this uh, 10 ohm load, which means that um, at the maximum output voltage, at the very, very maximum output voltage, we're going to have 0.5 volts and minus 0.5 volts delivered to a 10 ohm load. So at the, the maximum current this 10 ohm load will uh, ever see for our purposes, let's say is approximately 50 milliamp. Okay, no problem. Which means that this transistor's maximum current is going to be 50 milliamp. And this transistor's maximum current is going to be 50 milliamp, but they're only on one of them at a time. So we can only worry about one side. So it's 50 milliamp maximum current. If this guy has a beta of 25, it means that the maximum base current, the maximum base current is going to be equal to 2 milliamps. Why? Because 2 milliamps times a beta of 25 is 50 milliamp, which is a total current, maximum current will go through there. So the maximum current that we'll ever need to provide to this base is 2 milliamp, and that current has to come from this amplifier. So if I choose the tail current of this amplifier to be about 2 to 2.5 two times this, when there is no signal, then I will have enough current left off to, in order to provide a 2 milliamp. Remember, when this voltage is at its highest, is when there's going to need to be 2 milliamp going through here. So I want to have, I want to make sure there is some current left over for the transistor at the bottom to keep it operating in class A. So I'm just getting a rule of thumb. I'm saying that if the maximum base current required by this amplifier is 2 milliamp, let me put 5 milliamp in this amplifier in order to satisfy 
uh, making sure that I have enough current left off. Again, this is a rule of thumb. There are many ways you can do it. There's many numbers that will work. I'm just trying to minimize power consumption here. And I'm being conservative. I'm saying five milliamp in this one, five milliamp in this one, and that's going to satisfy our condition. The fact that we need at most two milliamp here and at most minus two milliamp there. So everything's taken care of. The only thing is to bias it. So I'm using a resistor at the top and a resistor at the bottom to create zero volts here. And I'm choosing the value of about 400 ohms at the top and the bottom, which if you remember from the previous video is we can calculate, we have zero volts here. And then we go up, uh, let's see, this is easier on this one. We have zero volts here. We go down, we get minus 0 0.6. So we have about, uh, let's say about 1.9 volts across the 400 ohm resistor. And it gives you about what the current that you need. So that's how I've chosen these 400 ohms. So if you were to build this circuit and then AC couple it so that we can you know, in, in put a signal at it, we're going to be able to build a class A followed by a class AB, which also has a very nice high output impedance, which is amplified by a factor of about, let's say, 25 times 25 beta squared. So the input impedance is very good. Now, why do I need this resistor here? Well, remember that none of these transistors are going to be identical. It's very important that we match the base emitter voltage to the base emitter voltage because if there is mismatches between these base emitter voltages then the output transistors end up fighting each other because if this guy's base emitter voltage is off by 20 percent compared to this guy and they don't match perfectly then the output of the these two emitters one of them wants to set it to zero the other one wants to set it to 0 0.1 and they're going to start fighting each other and you're going to have a lot of current going through these power transistors. By putting these 500 milliohm resistors, you protect against some of those imperfections, which will inevitably be there because none of these devices match. And this is the reason why I'm using TIP31, TIP32, TIP32, and TIP31 transistors because they're supposed to be matched NPN, PNP pairs to minimize the mismatches between all the voltages. And I've, you know, it's done, it does a pretty good job in, to do that. But because of those po possible mismatches, you have to put some protection resistors there in order to not damage your devices in case there are offsets. Also, you can change the value of these two resistors just by a little bit to move this voltage a little bit higher or lower in order to compensate for some of those mismatches as well. But keep that in mind. And uh, let's take a look at the circuits and let's start by building this one, measuring it seeing the imperfection, looking at the imperfection in the time domain, in the frequency domain, and then we're going to do exactly the same thing with this circuit, and we compare their performances. So I know that I went through a lot of material really quickly, but the basic idea is there, and here I've, I've done a really heuristic design. I'm, I've just chosen the currents, kind of roughly the back of an envelope calculation, but you can see how quickly you can get a good idea about what you need to do. And then we're going to uh, stress the circuits and then see how they perform. So before we get started, I'm just going to give you a quick shot of the lab. People have been asking me to do a little quick overview again of the stuff that I, that I have going on in the lab. So I had the only uh, new additions is that I bought a HECO used um, soldering iron, which I'm really happy about. Uh, I also had bought this a while back. And if you're buying one of these guys, make sure that you open this and uh, fix up the cabling because it has some exposed wires and make sure you glue it very carefully and so protect yourself in case uh, something goes wrong. Uh, I have a bunch of experiments lined up for the, with these guys. I haven't done those yet. Uh, a, lot, a lot of different uh, equipment here that I can use to do more videos. We saw, we saw this guy uh, that I repaired in one of the older videos. The, we've seen me use a bunch of these stuff in the past. Uh, we've seen, of course, we're going to use this guy again today. This is the uh, Fluke 196B, uh, which now, by the way, the back cover finally arrived, so it's now a whole unit. The Weha screwdrivers, which I've talked about. This I've just recently bought, uh, which I'm very happy. I bought this used on eBay for $300 with free shipping, which I consider to be a very, very good deal. It's fully functional. I've opened it, looked inside, tested it out. It works really well. So I'm, uh, it was a good find on eBay recently. There was nothing wrong with it, so I didn't really make a video about repairing it. And of course, the rest of the equipment here, which you've seen before, which we're going to use today. So let's get started. Okay, so let's see what I've built here. If you remember the schematic, uh, all I need to build for this particular class B amplifier is just a single transistor at the top, single transistor at the bottom, a 10 ohm load, and then the input. So I fear I've put it on the breadboard. Uh, don't concern yourself with, let me grab something here. Don't concern yourself with the uh, the rest of these circuits here. That's for the class AB, which I have to build afterwards. Uh, 
but the only thing you need to worry about is that here's my uh, PNP device at the top, here's my NPN device at the bottom, and if you look around the corner here, this is where I have used my 10 ohm resistors, just a single 10 ohm resistor sitting there, and everything is wired up and connected. These are This is my negative power supply, here's my ground, here's my positive power supply, so I can have plus and minus two and a half, and these guys go directly to the oscilloscope, the, clam, the, the two channels of the oscilloscope. The input signal is coming from these two clips, which is connected to this uh, uh, this PNC cable, which goes into a Rego DG5352, and I have uh, set it up to be uh, set at 50 kilohertz and a 3 volt peak to peak here at the input, so we can really see the effect of uh, this dead zone that I was talking about. As for power supplies, I'm using the again the Regal uh, DP1308A, and I've set plus and minus two and a half volts on it and you can see that the power consumption is zero because right now there is no signal present at the input and I, if you remember I mentioned that class B amplifiers consume no power if there is no input so everything is hooked up uh, the input is uh, the, the devices are already connected there's a bunch of decoupling cap which are very very important otherwise the whole circuit can oscillate uh, so let's uh, let me put this guy back up here and uh, we'll turn it on and take a look and see what comes out of the oscilloscope I can put the camera in. There we go. All right, so the circuit is all connected and ready to go. So I'm going to enable the input. Now I want you to see what happens when I enable the input. So remember the power consumption was zero. So I enable the input and we look at this. So you can see now there is power consumption, 19 milliamps. So it's about 50 milliwatt from each of the power supplies. And if I turn the input off, there's no input, you can see the power consumption goes to zero. So the power consumption is only there when there's input signal. But more importantly, let's look at what those signals actually look like on the oscilloscope. Here we go. A little bit more height. There. So this is exactly the kind of behavior that I discussed before. Channel one, which is yellow, is our input. So you can see you can enable, enable and disable, no problem. Now the blue is the output. Now you can see the output follows the input really nicely here, but there is a region in the middle where we get nothing, which is the dead zone that I was talking about. And then again the negative cycle, so on the negative cycle we have the bottom transistor conducting, on the positive cycle we have the top transistor conducting, and in the middle neither of them is conducting. So there's a region in the middle where the input is changing, but we see no effect of that at the output. We can see that better if we were to plot channel one versus channel two, and we can do that with the uh, with the Regal oscilloscope here, uh, the DS six one zero four. We're going to go under menu, and we're going to change the time base from Y with respect to T to be equal to uh, X Y. Here we go. There it is. Now you can see. This is XY relationship between the input and the output. Now, here in this portion, the curve is linear, which means there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the input and the output. In the middle, this is a vertical line, meaning that even though the input, remember, this is the input is this direction, output is in this direction. So horizontal is the input voltage, vertical is the output voltage. So you can see the input-output correlation is one-to-one, -one, but in the middle, you can change the input this way, but you can see the output has absolutely, uh, sorry, my, my mistake, you can change the input this way, but there is no change at the output. So I can, incre I can re increase and reduce the input signal. I can, go to two, I can go to two volts. You can see it becomes smaller. One volt, there is nothing, which means at, at one volt peak to peak, I get almost no change at the output. And we can go back to YT mode. There it is. You can see, look, the input is changing, but there is absolutely no change at the output. Why? Because that's 0.5, pos 0.5 volts to the top and 0.5 volts to the bottom is not enough to turn the base emitter junction transistors on. So if you look here, it basically means that we are swinging 0.5 up and 0.5 down, but not enough to turn any of these devices on, so there is no change at the output. So even though there is a 1 volt peak to peak input, we get nothing, so that amplifier doesn't do anything. And if I were to increase the output voltage, I can go slower from 1, see 1.1, you can begin to see the top transistor turn on, you can see begin to see the bottom transistor turn on, 
and I can push it further, further and further and further, you can see that uh, the dead, dead zone becomes a smaller portion of the overall waveform. But the dead zone is certainly there. So if I, if I keep it at 3 volt peak to peak, you can see the damage that it is doing to the output signal. Well, this looks bad, but how bad really is it? Is it really going to do so much damage? Well, a better way to see it is to see it in the frequency domain and see what that does to the spectrum of the signal. So I'm going to connect that up. I have this cable here, which is directly going to all the way to, if I can get it to the spectrum analyzer. So that cable is just running this way. So I'm going to connect, uh, connect this guy to the input. First, let's take a look at the input. Then we can take a look at the output. So let me reduce the input signal swing to one volt. There we go. And I will disconnect these signals and I will connect it to the spectrum analyzer so we can get a reference of what we should be expecting make sure it's there, there we go, so let's take this guy to the spectrum analyzer here we go, so this is the input signal when it's not going through the amplifier and it's always important to look at it uh, before it goes through the amplifier so you can get an idea of what is the input and you can compare it to the output, so here's the input tone if I do a peak search you can see the marker is at 50 kilohertz and it says minus 1.86 dBm and it's sitting there at, uh, at exactly at 50 kilohertz and it has some residual harmonics itself that's coming from the signal source it's, it's all the way down here but you can see the second harmonic is there uh, and so on and the third and fourth and, and so on so you can see that it's not perfect but it's, it has a, the difference between the fundamental and the second harmonic is quite large which is no problem uh, in terms of uh, signal purity and you can see the signal looks quite sinusoidal on the oscilloscope so what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect it and connect it to the output so I'm not going to move the camera I'm just going to connect it so I'm disconnecting the input right now connecting the input back to the circuit okay I've connected the circuit to the output so I'm going to enable it and there we go. Oh, in fact, it's actually too much. Oh, no, it's maybe it's okay. So, let me reduce the amplitude a little bit. I think I'm overloading the spectrum analyzer. Okay, now the spectrum analyzer is recalibrating itself, but anyhow, I'll stop in a moment. So, you can see that just the mess that appears in the spectrum domain once we, again, you can see the fundamental tone is there. That fundamental tone is still our most dominant tone. It is sitting at minus 6 dBm that's our fundamental tone, it's still bigger than everything else but just look at the mess that comes out of the circuit because of that dead zone imagine passing an audio signal through this and how horrible it will sound once you uh, have this much distortion coming out of your circuit so it's completely unusable as far as getting any meaningful uh, data out of this so that's why that dead zone is so detrimental to the performance of the circuit and you can see this is the signal that you're looking at that's the input and that's the output you can see the dead zone right there and that results even though you saw the spectrum of the of the first channel A how, how nice it was and the second harmonic was 40 dB or so below the fundamental here you can see that the second harmonic and the third harmonic the third harmonic is actually almost right there is maybe just under 10 dB maybe 7 dB below so that's that's pretty pretty terrible in terms of total harmonic distortion the total harmonic distortion of this signal is is awful and completely unusable so here's the, that's, the, that's the lesson to that is that even if something doesn't look so so terrible in the time domain you cannot trust that you should always rely on what you see in the frequency domain because frequency domain has a much wider dynamic range you can detect so much more than you can detect with your eyes alone uh, as opposed to looking at it on the oscilloscope but you can see the impact of the class B amplifier and why we don't want it to look like that so now we can actually move on to class AB so here's the class AB amplifier actually it's class A followed by class AB so here's my class A emitter followers the two that I showed in the schematic and here's my class AB amplifier which is biased at the edge of being turned on everything else is decoupling and here's my uh, resistor divider at the input and I'm using a potentiometer here to get rid of some of the mismatches between the devices which can be very important right now there's no signal being applied 
signal is one volt peak to peak, but it's turned off. And you can see that the power, there is some power consumption, about 17 milliamps or so, because I'm putting about five milliamp per uh, front class A amplifier, and there's some current going through the resistive divider, as well as some current due to the mismatches between the devices. So the current consumption is not zero like it used to be with just a pure class B, but this is a class A plus class AB, which has all the advantages that we talked about. So now if I were to turn on the, turn on the uh, output, you should see a significant improvement. Here we go. There it is. And you can see how much nicer we have. We have the output, which is blue, following perfectly the input. We can see perfect linearity between the input and the output. There is a little bit of loss through the circuit because there's the front end emitter followers don't have as don't have a gain of one everything has a gain of just under one so the output signal the input signal swing is 931 millivolt peak to peak and the output is 770 millivolt peak to peak and the difference between that is the loss of the circuit but i can provide it with uh, with more input for example you can see it works quite well still works even applying 2 volt peak to peak and it has a nice linearity so we can plot it again in terms of uh, the input versus output and we should see a perfect line because uh, there is no dead zone anymore and there it is you can see it's nice and linear and uh, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the input and the output you can see and turn it off and turn it back on now I'm going to increase the input continuously and then we'll see something else you can see that it just means that the input is growing and the output is growing and and beginning to see something a little different there we go so here's my it's a relatively easy one but here's my puzzle for the for the day I'm not gonna show you the time domain because I'll give it away so somebody tell me why does this happen I have now increased the input signal swing to about 5 volts and you can see that it happens. I'm going to make the input smaller. So you can see it's nice and linear. Increase the input signal, increase the input signal, and then we get this really weird effect. So I'd like to get you to tell me why does that happen and how we can avoid it and uh, where that is coming from. And it, should be, it shouldn't be very difficult, but it's something to think about. So let's go back to the time domain. Like so. Oops like so there we go here's our input and output so right now it's delivering 2.8 volt I'm, I'm giving it 2.8 giving 2.4 and I said the power consumption is quite a bit higher because we're delivering a lot of power but you can see the efficiency is significantly better than before and if I were to turn off the input I'm turning it off now the power consumption goes down to 17 milliamp which was the initial because of the class A amplifiers and so on turn it back on and then we're delivering power to a 10 ohm load you can see that power consumption goes up significantly which is what it's supposed to do so this is a this is a very good candidate for a start of a design of a class AB amplifier for an audio application now as the last little thing we're going to look at the signal again on of our spectrum analyzer so we can see the performance in the frequency domain okay so I've connected the output of the circuit uh, to my spectrum analyzer again uh, if I can get it in the camera we have this sort of thing again these wires are in the air and they're gonna pick up noise and so on but for our purposes of just getting a quick comparison this should be enough so here's the output you remember that the input looks really good the output of the class B was terrible and this is the output of the class AB and if you look at it on the regal uh, spectrum analyzer you can see oh that's my phone One second you can see that it is significantly better you can see that we have now, it's not as good as before, but it's as a pure signal because there is some distortion which you cannot avoid, but the difference is huge. We have now gotten most of our total harmonic distortion back. Some of these tones are being picked up because of the wires, but don't worry about that. But you can see that this second harmonic, third harmonic and so on are uh, quite, uh, quite much, much lower than before, almost as good as the input, and the difference is quite significant. So. There it is, we have built this circuit and we can see the advantages of it. Ah, my phone will not stop. You can see the advantages of it and uh, we are going to, uh, I'm going to now disassemble this because I don't need it anymore. But please uh, leave some comment, try and answer that question in the uh, comment section and participate in the discussions. As always, I appreciate uh, your really nice positive uh, feedbacks for everything. And if you have any more questions, 
feel free to share it and I'll try to answer them. And uh, until next time, and some more new experiments.